They, they'll hang me like a common criminal. And I didn't mean it. You know I didn't. Oh, stop whining, Gerald. Take your medicine like a man. What? All right, Harvey. I'll stop. You're responsible for the whole thing. You know you are. And since they can only hang me once, even for two murders... Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... Death's Goblet. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Sigmund Miller is Death's Goblet. It all began at one of Arthur Cunningham's parties. He always gave a party when he came back from one of his trips abroad. I went there with Gerald, my partner, and his wife, Susan. Beautiful Susan. Did I care for her? <laughs> People used to say so. But she was too self-centered a woman for me. Now, I like to look at her just as I like to look at anything that's uh, lovely. That was all. As for Gerald, well, he was rich, which was the only reason he was my partner. But suppose I start at the beginning, at the moment we got to the party and Arthur came over. Well, hello, Harvey. Glad you came. Wonderful to see you back, Arthur. You know Gerald and his lovely wife, Susan. Of course. Hello, lovely wife, Gerald. It's nice to see you again, Arthur. Good trip, Arthur. Marvelous. And you're just in time for a drink. Hey, let's get away from this mob. Come into the study. Oh, no. I just opened my last bottle of Chateau Albert. Oh, nice. Here we are. Oh, well, someone get the glasses out of the cabinet, will I you? Guess so. <laughs> the party's <laughs> making very <laughs> nervous. You know, I'm much yeah. Here we are. Here we are. Why, what an odd goblet this one is. Oh, uh, put that one back, Susan. Why, what's wrong, Arthur? Uh, use any of the others, but not that one. Oh, I'll be careful of it, if that's what you're worried about. Oh, it's not that. I just don't want you to drink from it. What's all the mystery about, Arthur? Well, you'd all think I was mad if I told you. Uh, take a look at it. It's a very strange-looking glass. Yes, looks uh, Venetian, possibly from Murano. It is. This red spot here on the side. Yes, it's supposed to be a drop of blood. Oh, that's very odd. How do you know that? Well, Gerald, this goblet has a legend, a terrible legend. And of course, none of you will believe it, but the story is that anyone who drinks from this goblet will kill someone. Oh, that, that's wonderful. And you believe it? Why, yes, Gerald. You see, I've had proof. Good heavens. I, well, I once drank from this goblet. What? Arthur, you're joking. You mean that Yes, you... Susan, it was justifiable homicide, but after I drank from it, I did kill someone. <laughs> he was a thief and he attacked me, but still I killed him. Well, you never told us about that. There's not anything that I care to remember particularly. Oh, how terrible for you, Arthur. Where did you get the goblet? From a murderer. A man who killed his wife. They were auctioning off his estate. Hmm. Extraordinary. May I look at the glass, Arthur? Yes, if you like. Everyone stared at the goblet in silence as I held it to the light. It had a delicate brown tint, reminding me of old blood, except that it sparkled and glittered. The spot of red did look like a drop of blood about to roll down the side. It seemed ridiculous that this inanimate object could make men commit murder, and yet there was something about it that, that fascinated me, and suddenly I wanted to drink out of it. You seem very interested in my goblet, Harvey. Yes, will you pour some wine in it for me? What? Oh, no, Harvey. This happens to be one superstition, I believe. Everyone who has ever put his lips to this goblet has killed. I don't know why it's so, but it is. Oh, it's silly, of course, but why tempt fate? Oh, nonsense, Gerald, nonsense. I'm going to drink out of it. You'll have to pour the wine yourself, Harvey. All right, I will. Well... Here's, um, health and uh, long life. No, Harvey, I won't let you. Oh, why, Susan, 
You shouldn't have done that. You've spilled some of Arthur's best burgundy and ruined a good tablecloth. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm glad you did it, Susan. I won't let you or anyone else drink from that glass. It's strange to get so distressed about a ridiculous legend. I don't think murder is ridiculous. You know, I'd like to get rid of it. I was thinking of destroying it. Well, why don't you just fling it against the fireplace? No, I can't. Uh-huh. I've tried several times, but somehow I couldn't. Um, Arthur. Yes? How about uh, giving it to me? I'd rather not. Oh, come on. You want to get rid of it, and I have a fine glass collection. I'd, I'd, I'd like to add to it. I'll keep it locked up. You'll be sorry, but if you want it that badly, Harvey, it's yours. Arthur, please don't give it to him. Susan, what's the matter with you? You watch over Harvey as if... Well, as if... As if what, Gerald? Oh, the whole business is absurd. Of course it is. Yes, and if I should drink out of it and commit a murder, that would be the most absurd thing of all. (laughs) I kept the goblet on the mantelpiece in my library where the lamplight made it glitter. I discovered that the red drop was not paint... It was ingrained in the glass. Oh, very cleverly. One night, both Susan and Gerald were at my home. As we chatted, I got up, went to the mantelpiece, and idly toyed with the goblet. That goblet? It's the one Arthur gave... Yes, yes, you remember. He gave it to me. Why don't you smash it, Harvey? Get rid of it. Ooh, it gives us all the creeps. Mm. Well, Gerald, you aren't really afraid of a piece of glass, are you? You don't believe Arthur's story at all, do you, Harvey? On the contrary, Susan, I do believe it. But uh, not the way you think. What do you mean? Well, I mean to say murder is not in the goblet. It's in me, in you, even in in Gerald. What a silly thing to say, Harvey. Oh, yes, you don't need a magic goblet to commit a murder. All you have to do is let yourself go. Let go of the civilized controls that tie you up. Why, Gerald, if you had cause, you could murder me or even your lovely wife. Oh, I couldn't kill a fly. Oh, but you could if the fly gave you enough trouble. Now, supposing, uh, just as an example, supposing that you discovered that Susan was really in love with me and only married you for your money. Harvey. Wouldn't that make you want to murder her, Gerald? Oh, you're crazy. That's not very funny, Harvey. Even you, Susan. What? Even though you have a lovely face and exquisite hands, even you could commit murder. Why, there must have been times when you hated Gerald, or only for a moment, of course. But in that moment... Eh, in that moment, if you were not so civilized... Stop it, Harvey. Why, you could even put your lovely hands around my throat. Oh, stop it, Harvey. <laughs> You're not that important to her. And then just why are we on this gruesome subject? That's Harvey's idea of humor. Susan looked at me, a touch of red at the point where the cheekbones make the skin taut. She seemed angry, but she wasn't really. Oh, yes, yeah, she loved me. I could see it in her face. She looked at me for a moment and then dropped her eyes. May I look at the goblet, Harvey? No, I'm afraid not, Susan. You might accidentally drop it. It might be a good idea. Well, I have an even better one, Gerald. And that's to go home before we get really serious about this murder business. I sat there staring at the goblet after they left. It... It fascinated me, glittering in the lamplight. And as I looked at it, it almost seemed as if the red spot of blood was uh, uh, moving, rolling down its side. Why, why shouldn't I drink from it? Why? And before I knew it, I'd taken it down and put it on the table. I got a bottle of burgundy, opened it, and I poured slowly, filling the goblet just up to the red spot. And then I drank from it. Uh, Seemed to me that the wine had a a different taste, although I drank this wine often and knew its taste well. It was delicious. Uh, I had another. It was heady. And it made me a little dizzy, although I felt fine and, and, and free. Yes, light and dizzy. But, but after a while, when the dizziness wouldn't go away, I decided to go for a drive, even though it was close to midnight. I 
I drove fast. The speed and power of the car gave me a feeling of great exhilaration. I took the turns at full speed, enjoying the danger of the sharp curves. Then I came to a long, level stretch of road. I pressed down hard on the gas. The needle of the speedometer slowly moved upward. 60, 70, 80, 85. The road, like a black ribbon, rolled up in front of me. And then I suddenly saw him, but it was too late. I struck him with my right fender. He never made a sound. The car swerved a little from the impact. With my heart in my throat, I stopped. Then I, I backed up. Back up. Back up. Back up to where the body was lying, sprawled grotesquely on the edge of the road. One look was enough. He was dead. But no one had seen the accident. I stepped on the gas and drove off. Death's goblet, and the man who drank from it, a corpse lying limp by the side of a lonely road, and a car speeding away as the clock strikes twelve for... Back to Murder at Midnight. Harvey challenged the curse of the goblet and found it true. He had just killed a man after drinking from it. Let's listen to him as he continues the story of Death's Goblet. I knew now that the story of the goblet wasn't a myth, and I also knew what I was going to do about it. The next night, I got Gerald to come to my house to do some work. Oh, oh, I can't make head or tail out of your cost estimates, Harvey. Oh, now, really, Gerald, it's very simple. Just concentrate. Oh, why can't you take care of it like a good fellow? I'm awfully tired. Well, all right, let's stop for a couple of minutes. Have a drink. Oh, what are you doing, Harvey? The goblet. Why, you don't really believe that story of Arthur's, do you? Well, You're much too intelligent for that. Oh. Well, you only pretended in front of Susan, didn't you? Well, I... <laughs> oh, yes. Had to pretend, you know, women. Well, of course. And even if you did believe it, I have a feeling that... Basically, you're pretty reckless, aren't you? Well, I used to be pretty wild when I was a young fella. <laughs> on a motorcycle once. And... Yes, yes, I know, yes. Well, let's drink up. Find me a victim, will you, Gerald? Huh? Well, you know, according to the legend, I've got to murder someone. Uh, maybe even you. <laughs> Harvey the murderer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh. Uh. Mm, very nice wine. How about another? Right. Well, here's to uh, your lovely wife. And um, how about switching glasses? Huh? Well, you might as well get a kick out of it, too. Um, well, uh, <laughs> okay, here goes. I watched the fool swagger as he drank down the wine. In an hour, when he was alone, he'd be shivering with fright at what he'd done. <laughs> well, I did it. You certainly did. Uh, by the way, Gerald. Yes? I checked Arthur's story about this goblet. Yeah? And it seems that he's right. Everyone who ever put his lips to this goblet has committed a murder. You mean... Well, of course, it's all coincidence, but uh, then again, who knows? All the next week, I kept reminding Gerald about his drinking from the goblet. I wasn't really trying to get him to kill, but it was amusing to see him get upset and uneasy. And I noticed he was getting a little bolder, particularly with Susan, and had developed a temper. And one night, just as I was about to retire... Hello, is that you, Harvey? 
Yes, Susan, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. I'm just a little worried about Gerald. He oh. usually gets home at about six, and it's 11 o'clock now. Do you know where he might be? Why, he's having dinner with his sister. His sister? Yes, a tall, dark girl. She was in the office today, and... The... Harvey, Gerald has no sisters. Oh, he hasn't? No. Oh, uh, I, um... Uh, I guess I got him mixed up with someone else. Yes, yes, it, it was Les Gordon who was meeting his sister. Yes, Gerald had some business to take care of over in Milford. You're not that's... very good at covering up, Harvey. I'm coming right over. Please wait up for me. I'm <laughs> good. Things are beginning to happen. It was becoming very interesting. Now we'd see. Harvey, I want you to tell me everything. I must know. Who is this girl? Take it easy, Susan. Come, sit down, sit down. Oh, never mind that. What about Gerald? I don't know anything about Gerald's private life. And besides, you're not the one to talk. What on earth do you mean? You know perfectly well what I mean. You don't really care for Gerald. Actually, you're in love with me. Harvey. Well, you are, aren't you? Oh, maybe... Sometimes I think I am. <laughs> oh, but you're too cold-blooded. I'd never be sure I could trust you. As a matter of fact, you'd like to get rid of Gerald. Why, why do you say that? Well, I'm just putting your thoughts into words. You never really loved him, did you? Oh, but Harvey... And he's finally become unbearable, hasn't he? Oh, Harvey, if you only knew... Do you know that the last time Gerald was here, he drank out of that goblet of Arthur's? It's possible that he wants to get rid of you, too. Oh, stop it! Stop it, you hear? Well, I'm just telling you what I think you ought to know. Oh, we'll see. I left word at home that Gerald was to meet me here. And if he does come, well, we'll see. We sat and waited, not talking much. Susan's face was pale and agitated. It was most exciting. Susan, with all her charm and embellishments, was really a fierce animal underneath. I could almost hear her rage seething. Are you expecting anyone? Just Gerald. Well, let him in. Oh, hello, Harvey. Susan, what's up? Why did you leave word to meet you here? It's almost midnight. Where have you been all the evening? At Milford. With whom? What's going on, anyway? What are you so excited about, Susan? What were you doing in Milford? Why, I went there on business. Oh, really? You've been behaving very strangely lately, Gerald. If you don't love me, why don't you say so like a man? What? This is all your fault, Harvey. You've been filling her head with poison. I? I had nothing to do with this. I told her that you went to Milford. All he did was to make me see clearly something I've felt for a long while. And I think this is the time to do something about it. Sue, oh, are you out of your mind? Put that gun down. You remember it, don't you? You gave it to me. Said it might be useful in an emergency. Harvey, take that gun away from her. She's liable to shoot. She won't shoot. She's only trying to frighten you. Am I? Let's see. Oh, oh my shoulder. Give me that no. gun. Give it no. to me. <laughs> Harvey. She... She's dead. Yes, Gerald. And you killed her. But... But it was an accident. She shot at me, and I was only trying to get the gun away from her. You know that's what happened. I only know that you drank from that goblet and that you killed her. What? But... Oh, you... You dirty treacherous. You planned all this so that you could get rid of me. So that you could have Susan. So you could have the firm for yourself. You'll have to do better than that to beat the gallows, Gerald. The gallows? Please, Harvey... We've been friends for a long time. You can't let me down. You wouldn't have pressed the trigger if you hadn't had murder in your heart, Gerald. You shot her because you wanted to. That's what I saw. I believe in telling the truth. Harvey, I'll turn over the business to you. I'll do anything, anything, if you'll just... I don't accept bribes, Gerald. All right. But I'll fool you. I'll call the police myself. Well, there's the phone. I'll prove my case in court. They won't convict me. Operator. Operator. Give me the police. Hello? Police department? This is Gerald Hamilton. I, I just accidentally shot my wife. And my friend's home. Yes, she's dead. The address is 411 Grove Street. That's right. I killed her. Accidentally. Yes. I'll be waiting here. Cigarette, Gerald? Oh, treating me like a condemned man, huh? Well, I'm not going to die. 
All I have to do is tell the truth about everything, including you. Oh, but you forget, Gerald. There must be fingerprints, your fingerprints on that gun. That won't look very accidental, will it? I... But... But Harvey... You did it, Gerald. I saw you. If you don't back me up, they'll hang me like a common criminal. Please, Harvey, don't let them do that to me. Please. Oh, stop whining, Gerald. What? All right, Harvey, I'll stop. You're responsible for this whole thing. You know you are. And since they can only hang me once... You raised the gun, but I'd been expecting it. I grabbed his hand, pushed it against his chest. My finger pressed on his and on the trigger. And suddenly... He went limp. You won't get away. My alibi was perfect. All I had to do was wait for the police that he himself had called. The minutes ticked slowly away. And then... Hello, Harvey. Arthur. Glad I found you in. Say... You look as if you'd been in a fight. Arthur, you'd uh, you'd better not come in. Why? What's the matter? No, no, you, you'd better not come in. Oh, but why? Well, uh, uh, Gerald and uh, Susan, they, they had a quarrel, and he killed her. What? And then he shot himself. What are you talking about, Harvey? Well, all right, come in. Look for yourself. <sighs> Good. Good Lord. Mm, tried to kill me, too. But, but why? It doesn't sound like him, like either of them. Well, I don't know why. Fit of insanity? Or maybe it was the... the goblet. Your goblet. He drank out of it, you know. The goblet? Why, that's ridiculous. As he spoke, he picked up the gun. It made me furious. All those fine fingerprints of Gerald's were now erased. Put that gun down, Arthur. There are fingerprints on it. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize... I tried to get hold of myself. The stupid fool, he was going to ruin everything. But I had to keep calm. What, uh, what were you saying about the goblet? Why, it has no curse or magic. I just made that story up. You, you, you made it, you mean... Of course, I bought the goblet in an antique shop. As a matter of fact, I have a whole set of them. Pulses hammered away in my head. A vast, uncontrollable anger seized me. Was it because of those precious fingerprints that he'd wiped out? Or because I had believed in the goblet myself? I don't know. I only know that I had to fight to keep from grabbing him by the throat. You know, I don't think you're telling me everything you know about this horrible business, Harvey. In fact... A red-hot wave came over me. I don't remember exactly what happened. Let me go! Get your hands off me! Oh. Arthur's body is lying there too now, next to Susan's and Gerald's. But the police will be here any minute, so I have to hurry. First, the goblet. There, that's done. That. No. Some of the broken fragments still glitter in the lamplight. I've got to crush them, grind them to powder under my heel. But but there are always other pieces that I can't find. They're, They're hiding from me. They're afraid of me. But I'll find every piece. I'll find them. I'll find them. I'll find them. bodies lying huddled on the floor, and the madman crushing the fragments of the broken goblet to powder as the police car drives up and the clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. of a friend, and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. 
part of Harvey was played by Eric Dressler. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leder. <laughs>